scripture reading for this morning comes from 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good God, all good works. Thank you, Jay. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see each and every one of you out this morning. And I say this so often, I hope it's not taken as something that the preachers just say, because I, I mean it most sincerely, that your presence this morning is a true encouragement to me. And it is uplifting that you've chosen to worship the Heavenly Father with us this morning. And I pray that the things I speak from the Word of God would be an exhortation or an encouragement to you that would help you to live the way that God would have you to live as you go throughout this week and the rest of this life. I wanted to start this morning by introducing a, a good friend. And, um, you know, I, I didn't realize how appropriate this was going to be. We have so many visitors with us this morning. It's always great to see different members. It's as though I never meet all the Haggerty's, Hazel. They, they just keep coming. And uh, it's wonderful to see such a, a great and uh, tight family. It's great to meet new members all the time. But I knew our dear friend Lori was going to be with us this morning. And it was absolute serendipity that the plumbers showed up this morning. I, I say the plumbers. Chris has been a plumber for as long as I've known him. But I've never known them to do any plumbing. Um, but they're dear friends from, uh, that we attend with at Lady Mary. It's just wonderful to, um, to see them and to have the opportunity to worship with them again. But when I said that I was going to introduce a, a dear friend, I, it could have been any of them that I've introduced them. But you see, I had a, a Bible. And in fact, I've recently given it to Christian that my mother gave to me. Um, for Christmas in 1994. Now that year I snuck in with a razor and I cut all the tape on the Christmas presents and opened them up very carefully and looked to see what I had. And then I taped them back up and would have been all the good better and, and not caught had it not been for my squealing sister who told on me. And uh, my sister told on me and my mother told me that she was going to take all my gifts back and, and maybe get me something else. And I told her she ought not lie about the Bible that way. Because I knew that one of those gifts was the Bible that Christian is carrying with him. She's now I'm taking it back to her. I said, I don't believe you. <laughs> and she did change the box at the time, but that's why I have. And by the year I graduated in 98, I had a lot of marks in that Bible, a lot of passages, anything I was forced to memorize, I, I highlighted in that Bible. And then when I graduated high school, and, and those of you that see me on a regular basis don't see my Bible in this form, because I normally keep it in cover, but the Somerville congregation gave me this Bible when I graduated high school. <coughs> and I keep it in cover because it wants to last forever. I know it's not going to. The Word will. It's in your, in your uh, bulletins, you see what Jesus said in Matthew 24th chapter, that the Word would last forever. This, unfortunately, is, is not going to last forever. He's a dear friend of mine. I worry about him when he's not near. Every once in a while, I'll, I'll leave him somewhere and be a little bit un, irresponsible. And I worry about him until I, till I find him again. My children know you, you don't touch my Bible. And you see, I could get another copy of the Word of God, and really that's what's most precious is the Word of God. But you see, this one has all my notes in it. Many of the pages have tears in it. I have a tear from both Christian and Evie, a few from Christian, or excuse me, and one or two from Anna. And I know those pages when I come across them because they're taped and there's a couple words you have to memorize because you just can't quite read them all that well. And I, I didn't get them taped to align very well. I bled on Daniel the third chapter while preaching. I got a bloody nose and and John noticed I said, John, can you come read this passage? And he came up and fluffed his Bible on top, not realizing what's going on. 
smeared Daniel 3 with blood. And so Daniel 3 has never been the same again in my Bible. <laughs> For years, I kept my grandmother's obituary in Proverbs, the 31st chapter. But the kids just were too fond of the picture. They kept taking it out. I've got a $2 bill that reminds me of my grandfather in the book of Proverbs. I've got a $20 Guyanese bill in Matthew, the 28th chapter, that was given to me by Dave Newberry to remind me of the need for spreading the gospel abroad. That $20 bill, or, or it may actually be a $100 bill, it's a 20. He's given some hundreds that day. It's worth mere pennies. But it's more money than most people in Guyanese will see in a year's time. So in short, it's a dear friend. It's precious. And, and sometimes I feel guilty as we do with our loved ones for not spending quite enough time <coughs> with them. And that's the topic this morning. God's Word. The Bible. Do we take for granted, you know, there was a time when people had to give their lives. For the words that were in this. There was a time, as we looked at last week, that it wasn't complete. In fact, it was only in portions that the word was given. And we studied or looked at the idea last week of miraculous gifts and the miracles that took place during the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, in verse 11, there was an amazing statement made to me, or made in Scripture. It's amazing to me. And there Paul wrote to these Corinthians and the Corinthian Christians, excuse me, and was telling them about these miraculous gifts. And he likens the gifts of miracles. The, the healing of the sick, the, the raising of the dead, the ability to prophesy, to speak in, in languages. I wish I could speak in, in more sign. <laughs> the, these Folks sometimes tell me I need to um, study. This is read. But I need to read and study more. And I'm, I'm behind on my sign. I wish I could, without studying, be able to sign perfectly and communicate with those who aren't able to hear. And all these wonderful things that happened in where they had the ability of doing in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, and verse 13, likens it onto as child's play in comparison to the written word of God. And examine that, he says, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I thought as a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And we looked at the idea last week that the idea of what was complete, the idea of what was man-like, adult-like, in comparison to those miracles was the written word of God. Do we underappreciate it? How many of us would say, oh, to live during the time of miracles, to be able to heal my loved one back to life, to be able to reach those who speak in other language without ever studying that language. But God says it's child play in comparison to the written word. Why is that? Why is it that we could say that? And I don't think that very often times we, we teach out of the Bible so much that sometimes we don't teach about the Bible quite as much as we should. But the Word of God, the Bible is referred to as the Word of God. And that's significant. That's significant not only because it means it came from God, but it's significant because in saying that it's the Word of God, it has a lot of attributes that are very different than words that we are used to. Turn the lights out. You see that? No one moved. Just look at me funny. <laughs> but you know, when God said, let there be light, way before there was electricity, there was light. And when God said, let there be, you see, His Word had an impact. It had power behind it. And when we read about the Bible being the Word of God, I think we would do well to remember Genesis, the first chapter, and to realize that the Word of God has power. 
And that therefore, what we have in our lives, as Paul said in Romans, the first chapter and verse 16, that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, where is the power? Dino is the Greek word used there. That we get dynamite from. It is the power of God unto salvation. And what we have in our hands and what we're able to carry about and have so many different copies of has power and power to change the world, power to change the lives, and power to change the circumstances that we find ourselves in. But not only does the Word of God have power, it always accomplishes an effect. It do, it's not ineffective in what it does. In Isaiah, the 55th chapter, in verse 1, there Isaiah makes an incredible statement about the Word of God. You noticed a few minutes ago that I told the lights to be out and it had no effect other than giving in some alarm blitz from, from some of you folks. But in Isaiah, the 55th chapter, in verse 11, Isaiah says this about his word, about God's Word. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Isaiah is talking about the word of God when he says that. He says it will not return unto me void. The word void means empty. You may remember in Genesis, the first chapter, and verse 2, that we see that earth was void and without shape. It was empty. It was, it was just not really of anything of usefulness. The Word of God never returns to him without accomplishing what it has set out to do. And we saw that illustrated so well in Genesis, the first chapter. But thirdly, in John, the 12th chapter, and this is amazing to me, we call ourselves, what this morning? Maybe plumbers, some of us. <laughs> Bob, what are you? You're not just an Alec. What are you? First and foremost, Christian. Christian. Meaning, I follow Christ. Right? But notice this about the authority of the Word of God. You know, we follow Jesus, but do we stop to think sometimes that Jesus had one he was following? Jesus didn't come into this earth and say, here's what I'm going to teach. We looked last week in Matthew 7th chapter that by the time he was done with the Sermon on the Mount, that the people marveled at his teaching because he taught as though one having authority. He taught having authority. But that authority was not initiated on what he wanted to say or what he believed needed to be said. In John the 12th chapter, in verses 48 and 49, we read this said of Jesus, He that rejecteth me and receives not my words has one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same, shall judge him in the last day. For I, now this is the part that we're getting at this morning, for I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment that what I should say and what I should speak. Do you see that? Jesus did not speak under his own initiative, but rather spoke as authority was given to him from the Heavenly Father. Boy, now there is some consequences for my life, isn't there? Do you think that after I look at Jesus Christ and see that he did not speak as he wanted to speak, he did not give the commandments he wanted to speak, that I ought to feel good and comfortable in giving the commandments of Mike this morning? By what authority? If Jesus Christ did not take that authority, but rather we see the authority is in the Word. The Word that he spoke, that Jesus gave, to be passed down that came from the Father of God. We need to be close. We need to have a relationship. Oftentimes we've talked about having a relationship with Jesus or having a relationship with God. But we need to have a relationship. And in order to have those other relationships, we need to have a relationship with the Word of God. And how blessed we are because it is the Word of God 
that we have. Secondly, though, I would like to look at the idea that miracles are child play in comparison to the written word because it is by the inspiration of God. In 2 Timothy, not second time, 2 Timothy, the third chapter in verses 16, we see that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. All scripture is given by the inspiration. Now, sometimes the way we use this word inspiration, it's, it's not all that strong of a word, is it? I may inspire you to do something relatively small. I may encourage you. Or something that you see in me or see in someone else may inspire you to take a certain action. But the Greek word here is much stronger than what we would use to say inspired to that. When we read in 2 Timothy, the third chapter, verse 16, about the word of God being inspired, or the word being inspired by God, the terminology used there is that English Standard Version so well points out, means it's God breathed. All scripture is breathed out by God. Now that's a bit stronger, isn't it, in our language today. But let me take this a step further. You've taken numerous breaths since I started to speak here this morning. Most of those breaths are unconscious. that You didn't even think about them. And the people around you didn't even notice them. When we read that all scripture is breathed by God, we're not talking about, or it's not meaning, the unconscious breath of mankind. It's talking about, there's a breath that we can recognize, right? <laughs> and that's a great illustration. <laughs> the, these little ones breathe out. They force out the air. And it's noticed by those who are around them. And that's the kind of breath that is talked about in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. God breathed means that he breathed it out. He forced it out. As a young child may force that air out of their lungs. That's strong, isn't it? That God forced his word. Now what is his word? And what does that mean? that it is inspired or breathed by him. In 1 Peter, the first chapter, in verse 21, we read this statement along the lines of inspiration. Who by... 2 Peter will be more, uh, more relevant, I do believe. We'll give that a try. 2 Peter, verse 1, verse 20, chapter 1, verse 20, it says... Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For, verse 21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now that gives us another detail into the idea of being God-breathed. You see, this idea of being inspired or God-breathed goes to the point that the men of the Old Testament, the men who were writing the scriptures of God, didn't say, oh, I think I'm going to write a, a passage of scripture today. I think I'm going to write something that God would like people to know. No, it was forced upon them. It wasn't by their own will. It was breathed out by God, or as we see in 2 Peter 1.21, by his enacting of the Holy Ghost. Now allow me to illustrate that, and let's take into account just how significant that is. God forced his word. I want to think about this logically for a minute. You know, some people logically have problems believing that this could be the word of God. The infallible, inspired, completely sufficient word of God. I want to think about this logically. If we serve a God, we'll start with that premise. If we serve a God who was capable of speaking and the earth was, do you think that God would be capable of communicating? How many of you married folks have problems? You don't, please don't raise your hand. I'm just... I <laughs> How many of you have problems in your marriage with communicating? 
How many of you have failures in communication? There's a lot of grins, mostly from the wives. The husbands are looking uncomfortable right now. Now, we're still able to communicate, though, aren't we? We don't do the best job of it. But understand this, we serve a God who was able to speak, and it was. I believe that rationally, if we believe in that idea of creation, we must and are forced to believe that that same God is not powerless in his ability to communicate. <laughs> no, we talk about faith being blind or, or faith being in opposition of evidence sometimes. But consider this fact. I'm going to ask five men to give me one word. I'm sorry, Chris. You're, you're right here in my eyesight. And it's great to see. Give me the first word that comes to your mind. Oh, well, first. <laughs> first, okay. I didn't think you were going to get one out. First. Paul. First word comes to your mind. First word. We're playing memory game, right? Red? Red? Sam? Blue. blue. First word, red, blue. One more. Um, Ron, give me a word. <laughs> Are you still back on the on the spouse analogy? <laughs> the next word is going to be bruised. <laughs> All right, where are we getting at? Here? Five words in the matter of just a couple minutes. Here's my sentence. Right? Here's the sentence. First word, red, blue, crazy. <laughs> Make any sense? No, you guys aren't very good at communicating. <laughs> Your wives may have a point. <laughs> now consider this. The Bible was written. It had one author, as we examined earlier, that God breathed it. He forced the Word of God. However, there were right around 40 writers over a period of 2,000 years. Now consider that during that 2,000 years, there were a number of different dispensations, two different dispensations, or ages, right? Over that 2,000, actually three, we could add the one of Christianity into there, the patriarchal, the mosaic, and the Christian age. Over three different dispensations. It came in the form of 66 individual separate and independent books with over the time of numerous political governments you getting the drift here? and yet it has one <coughs> unified message that is in complete agreement with each other part and with itself. We can't take five words. I, I didn't think to look up the statistic of how many words are in the English translation of the Bible, but there are tens of thousands, I'm sure, over 2,000 years, and it agrees. Brothers and sisters, friends, I strongly suggest that is evidence that Scripture is exactly what it claims to be. It is forced by the will of God. But secondly, in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, in verse 12, we see that the Word of God is what? It's sharp, isn't it? It's sharper than any two edged sword. In verse 12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. Now I would suggest to you that the word of God, the written word of God is a tremendous blessing beyond what we can even appreciate because it is inspired by God. And that makes it alive. 
In Genesis, the second chapter, verse 7, we see very similar language to this idea of God breathing. In Genesis 2 and 7, we see that God breathed into Adam's nostrils. What happened? He didn't lay there motionless, did he? He was alive. And you see, when God breathed his word, when he breathed into his word, it became alive. Just as we read in Hebrews 4 and 12. For those of you that still have the, the King James translation, the word quick there isn't referring to fast. It simply means alive. The word of God is alive and powerful. And that leads us right into the second point, that it is powerful. Notice what it is able to do. Now, we have nuclear weapons today. We have all kind of weaponries, don't we, that's able to destroy mankind. But the Word of God is more powerful than any of them. For one illustration, most of our weapons have been employed in destroying this Word over the past 2,000 years. And yet, each of those who have employed themselves towards destroying the Word of God no longer walk, or unless they're still alive, they soon will depart from this earth. But over the ages, they no longer exist on this earth. And yet, as Jesus said in Matthew 24th chapter, His Word will always stand because it is powerful. It's not only powerful to resist the destructive forces of Satan and all of his hoodlums and all the people of the world, but it is powerful enough to slice between the physical and the spiritual to the intents of the heart. Bob and I oftentimes joke about which one of us is stronger. And boy, Hunter made out, for those of you who didn't know, Hunter made out well last week. I asked Hunter if I could beat Bob in an arm wrestling contest, and he said yes. So I was going to give him a dollar for that afterwards, and the smallest bill I had was a 10. I hope you put the good, good use, Hunter. I did. <laughs> 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 Mom did. <laughs> Bob's all snacks on the way home. <laughs> Bob's everyone's snacks. That's good to share. Um, it, it was well worth it, believe me. My analogy got me distracted. <laughs> it's about, oh, we joke about being powerful, right? We talk about who's being strong and we jest back and forth. But the Word of God is so powerful, no matter how strong you are, you cannot change someone's heart. You cannot inflict your will upon anyone else. Think about the idea of torture. It doesn't work to change someone's heart, does it? No matter how much physical pressure you put on someone. You can't touch their intent in your heart. But the Word of God can. The Word of God can change your heart. Can change the way you see the world. Can change the way I see the world. It is more powerful than any physical weapon. In 2 Timothy, the third chapter, in verses 16 and 17, we conclude this idea about what the Word of God through the inspiration is. You see, not only is it powerful, not only is it strong, but I almost forgot 1 Peter 1 and 3 that says, according to his divine power, he has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. God's word is not just powerful, it is sufficient. It is equipped to, to enable us and to help us through absolutely every instance in our lives. And therefore, it is relevant. Isn't it amazing? Over thousands of years in the book is still relevant. 4,000 years since it was first started to work. Now, we're not going to go too deep into this idea. Um, for one, Notre Dame plays tonight around 5 or 6, and Frank told me I had to be done by then. <laughs> and, and two, we're going to get into this idea later. Uh, next week, Lord willing, of relevancy of Scripture. But the Scripture, the inspired Word, is relevant for your life. What does 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16 say? All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable. That word profitable means useful. The Word of God is not only inspired, it is useful. For what? For doctrine. 
for reproof or conviction. It's good at telling us you ought not be doing that. It's good for correction, useful for correction. Here's what you ought to be doing. And training or instruction in righteousness. Not only is this how what you should be doing, but here is how you do it. You see, the Word of God is sufficient and it's relevant to our lives. I look around this morning and I mention some of the faces I haven't seen for a while. I think of the faces I have seen for a while. Dear friends, some of you don't spend as much time as I would like to spend with you. I think of my grandparents. I mentioned them. I'm sure by now you understand, you know how precious they were for my life. What I wouldn't do to sit in a room once again with my grandmother, rocking rhythmically in a rocking chair, smiling, giving a positive outlook to everything in life. To see my grandfather sitting across the room in the corner of his couch, giving the words of wisdom that I so dearly need to this very day. I wouldn't do to have a little bit more of that time back. Then I think of my children. What a precious blessing they are. How awful would it be the times we get distracted, right? And there's times in my life I'll go a week or so and, and barely see my children. And ah, it bothers me. to see. What have I done? <laughs> I want to spend time with them again. I want to spend as much time with them as I can because I know there's a time coming when just as with my grandparents we will forever be separated if they're a good period of time at least be separated. I know that they're going to be grown and they're going to start making their own decisions and they're not going to be the decisions I'd like them to make all the time. That time is coming. I need to spend as much time with them as I possibly can and cherish those moments. Folks, we've got a short period of time in this earth, don't we? We've talked this morning about a tremendous blessing. As great as my children are, as great as the impact of my grandparents were on my life, those things don't compare <clears throat> with the Word of God. Am I spending the appropriate amount of time with it? Am I getting to know it? Am I God get to know it? Am I enacting it in my life like I ought to enact it? It's of no wonder to me that we've spent some time this morning in 2 Timothy, the third chapter, in verses 16 and 17. But it's of no wonder to me that in a prior chapter, Paul said to Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What's he saying? Timothy, spend time with them. Spend time, get to know them, bleed on them, rip them, make your notes on them, but know them inside and out. Because by chapter 4, we're going to tell Timothy, we're going to tell me, we're going to tell you, preach them. Preach the word. <coughs> Share that blessed gospel that's able not only to save my life, but it's not only to save your life, but it's able to, con to contact and save the lives of those who are around us. Let's make sure that we don't forsake such a wonderful and beautiful blessing. This morning, if you're subject to the invitation given in God's very word, to accept him in belief, as John 3 and 16 tells us. To confess his name before men, as Matthew 10, 32 and 33 instructs us to do. To repent of our sins, as Acts 2 and verse 38 tells us to do. And to be immersed for the remission of those sins, as again, Acts 2 and 38 from his word instructs us to do. You're subject to that gospel call. From the word of God that has power, that has efficacy, efficacy, and has What's the last point to me?
It was the important one. That's the one. That's why I wanted to say I'm sorry. It has authority to tell us what's right. From his word. You're subject to that gospel call. Please come forward as we stand as we sing.